go through the entire chapter, we'll see. So we're going to start with the first PowerPoints of chapter six. And first thing we're going to start with will be the functions of the skeletal system, uh, which the, there's a pretty obvious support, protection, movement. Uh, when it comes to protection, uh, bones protect some important organs like the brain, the spinal cord, uh, the thoracic cavity, the ribs protect the heart and the lungs. Uh, these other two functions may not be as obvious, but you should know them by now because we have mentioned about bones being the place where minerals are stored, more specifically uh, calcium and phosphate minerals, and also is the place where fat tissues are stored inside of uh, the bones, bone marrow, yellow marrow is made of, uh, of fat tissue. So this is another storage of fat that we have in the body. Another important function of the skeletal system is hematopoiesis, which refers to blood cell formation. That takes place in red marrow. So some bones are going to have a yellow marrow, which is a storage of fat. Other bones will have red marrow, which is hematopoietic tissue. Now, bone tissue is connective tissue. All connective tissue is going to be made of uh, cells and matrix. Now, other components of bone that we find within the skeletal system are going to be cartilage, which is also connective tissue. And there's a specifically two types of cartilage that are found in relation to bone. Hyaline cartilage, which is the most abundant cartilage in the body, and then fibrocartilage, which is found uh, connecting a few bones. There's three locations, the specific locations where we're going to find fibrocartilage. Also part of the skeletal system are going to be ligaments, which connect bone to bone. Uh, tendons are considered part of the muscular system, but they're mentioned here because they're going to connect muscle to bone. Um, so remember, cartilage is connective tissue. As connective tissue, it has two, two components. It's going to have cells, and it's going to have matrix. The matrix of cartilage is going to be semi-solid, so because it's a semi-solid matrix, there will be lacunae where the cells will be found. Since the, the substance is not a liquid substance or a jelly substance, it's a semi-solid substance. The cells are going to be chondroblasts, chondro and cartilage, blast and young. So the young cells that make cartilage are the chondroblasts. The mature cells of cartilage are going to be called chondrocytes. These are the cells that are found in the lacunae, which are going to be the uh, areas in the semi-solid matrix where the, where the uh, cells are going to be found. So the cells are going to be found inside these areas of the matrix called the lacunae. Something else we're going to find in, in the matrix of the cartilage are going to be collagen fibers. Both hyaline and fibrocartilage are going to be rich in collagen fibers. Uh, the pericordium is a membrane that covers the outside of cartilage. And yeah, let me go back to the other PowerPoint. The articular cartilage right here. Articular cartilage is the cartilage found at the end of bones in the places where two bones connect. So the structure is called articular cartilage. The tissue that makes articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage. So one of the locations where hyaline cartilage is found is at the end of long bones making articular cartilage. So take a look at this picture. Here's the long bone right here. At the end of the long bone, there's this covering of hyaline cartilage which we call articular cartilage. And it's called articular cartilage because it will be found in the places where the bone articulates with other bones. The tissue that makes articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Yes, you have a question? Go ahead. Okay. Is, it, is it the same cartilage that's at the end of a chicken bone? Exactly, yes, exactly. That is exactly what it is. Yes, so at the end of the chicken bone, you have that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, whitish structure there that is kind of crunchy. And that is, that's articular cartilage, and that's made of hyaline cartilage. Now, the difference is that when you are looking at a chicken bone, you're looking at dead tissue. And, and that's why it is so crunchy. 
um, in live in a live animal, hyaline cartilage is going to be like a sponge. It's going to be filled with fluid, so it shouldn't be crunchy. But yeah, that's point. Okay, so um, let's see. So again, the uh, most abundant cartilage, hyaline cartilage, we find it at the end of long bones uh, or at the end of bones where they're articulating with other bones. Um, hyaline cartilage found at the end of ribs is called costal cartilage. And we should have seen that in the tissue chapter. Fibrocartilage is a little bit different. It does have uh, collagen fibers. It does have lacunae. It does have osteocytes. But the structure is a bit different. There's more collagen in fibrocartilage than there is in hyaline cartilage. There's only three places where we find fibrocartilage. The pubic synthesis which is in the pelvic bone, where the two pubic bones come together in the anterior aspect, the intervertebral discs in between vertebra, and the meniscus of the knees, which are the two pads of cartilage in between the knee bones. Um, and elastic cartilage is not associated with bones. So here's just depicting the places where we find the cartilages, and we're more interested in, in uh, hyaline and fibrocartilages. So here is the pubic synthesis, uh, meniscus of the knee right there, and intervertebral discs right there. So you should definitely know the three places where fibrocartilage is found. As far as hyaline cartilage associated with bone, costal cartilage, and articular cartilage right there. Okay. Now, when it comes to the growth of cartilage, this is going to be similar to the growth of bone. And we're going to uh, use the same kinds of terms. And we're going to see later that what we call a positional growth of cartilage or bone refers to a, um, um, a, a growth to the outside, making the tissue or the structure thicker. Uh, this is a growth that, when it comes to bone at least, it happens throughout our life. When it comes to cartilage, it does end at puberty. So positional growth refers to that thickening and, and growing of the cartilage. Um, interstitial growth, one that in which the cartilage grows from within and allows for the extension uh, in length. So a positional is thickness, interstitial is length. Um, cartilage, though, um, does end, the growth ends at puberty. And by then, by, by puberty, the cartilage will be calcified and it will turn to bone. Not all of it, though. Obviously, articular cartilage will remain. Uh, fibro cartilage will remain, um, but most of the of the growth that is happening uh, in the uh, cartilage in the growth plate, for example, will be closed down and will become bone. And all cartilage really does become bone eventually. So costal cartilage diminishes as we grow older. Um, eventually, if you know we live long enough, most of our cartilage will turn to bone. All right, so that's uh, the difference between ligaments and tendons. Um, we covered that already several times. Ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone. Okay, so let's turn to bone tissue. So again, we're going to spend some time on bone tissue because to understand um, the problems we have with bones, you have to understand how is the, uh, the composition of bone. So again, this is going to be connective tissue. It's a bit of a special type of connective tissue though. Um, it is made of cells. And it's going to be made of three populations of cells, uh, actually four populations of cells. Uh, we're going to have the uh, germ cells, which we're going to call osteoprogenitor cells. And we'll, we'll have a PowerPoint for these later on. So these are the germ cells that are constantly dividing. And when they divide, they're going to uh, turn into another cell called osteoblast which is a young bone cell, and the osteoblast eventually matures and becomes an osteocyte. These cells are all related to each other. They all come from the germ cell, the osteoprogenitor cell. Aside from these, there is another group of cells which are not related, but they are found in bone. These are going to be called the osteoclasts. It's a completely different uh, family of cells. Okay. So those are the cells we're going to talk about in relation to bone. Now, bone is connective tissue, so it's also made of matrix. So matrix. Now, the matrix of bone tissue is uh, different from other connective tissues in that it actually has three components, not two. So we have the uh, ground substance, 
that we always expect in connective tissue. Okay, so nothing different so far. Uh, we have the protein fibers, which in the case of bone tissue will be collagen fibers. Again, nothing different so far. Um, these components right here are going to be made by the cells, specifically osteoblasts. So osteoblasts are making these uh, ground substance and protein uh, fibers, uh, um, collagen protein fibers. These substances are organic, meaning they are made of uh, you know, organic molecules, proteins mostly. Okay. And organic molecules must be made by cells. Those are the only things that can make organic molecules. The third component of bone tissue is inorganic. So it's not made by cells. It has to be eaten. This is calcium phosphate. So this calcium phosphate uh, form crystals, and this is inorganic, and we get it from food. Yeah. So this is what makes the matrix of uh, bone tissue solid. So that's what makes it different from other connective tissue. So we need to distinguish between the organic components of the matrix right here. So this will be organic, which is secreted by the osteoblast, and it will be maintained by osteocytes. And the inorganic component, which is going to be the calcium phosphate crystals. And again, we're going to eat the inorganic component. We're going to get it from foods. The organic components are going to be made by the cells from substances that we eat, but it's, but it's going to be made by the cells. OK, so you definitely need to know that. Um, here you have the ground substance, the protein fibers, collagen fibers. And this is something that students often forget, is that bone tissue has collagen fibers. And then we have the third component, which are the hydroxyapatite crystals made of calcium phosphate. Most of the bone matrix, 65%, is made of these inorganic components. So it is an important part of bone tissue. The organic components, which are going to be the ground substance and the uh, collagen fibers, are going to be synthesized by osteoblasts. And we call the organic component, we call it the osteoid. So we can say that osteoblasts synthesize the osteoid of the bone matrix. And you should know that the osteoid refers to the ground substance and the collagen fibers, which are the, the organic components of bone matrix. The inorganic component has to be eaten, ingested from food uh, with the help of vitamin D, we're going to absorb the calcium and the phosphate. These components will circulate blood and will be deposited uh, into the bone with the help of cells, osteobl like osteoblasts. Osteoblasts help in, the, in depositing the inorganic components onto the uh, bone matrix. So again, just to reiterate, um, most of the matrix of bone tissue is inorganic, 65% is calcium phosphate crystals, also called hydroxyapatite crystals, and some a few other minerals in there too. Uh, minority of the matrix are the organic components, which is also called the osteoid, which is made of collagen fibers and ground substance. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of osteo words in this chapter, so you're just gonna have to try to keep them straight. And this is what happens when bone tissue is uh, deficient in one component or the other. So if we have the mineral component, the matrix, the calcium, if that is deficient, what's left is going to be the collagen fibers. Collagen is like leather, is bendable. So now you have these soft tissue, soft bone that is bendable, that can bend, that cannot withstand weight without bending. On the other hand, if the collagen is removed, is now we don't have the organic component to make it bendable, now bones become too brittle. And they cannot bend with, with stress. And instead of bending, they break. Okay. So in order to be healthy, bone must have both components, the collagen fibers and the uh, inorganic uh, calcium phosphate crystals. This is something you should definitely know. You should definitely know what happens to bone if 
the calcium is missing, what happens to bone if the collagen is missing? Um, so now we turn to the cells themselves. And uh, the population, the three populations of cells that are related to each other are going to be the osteocyte, osteoprogenitor cells, um, okay, which are missing from this picture. So osteoprogenitors, uh, they are in another PowerPoint. And osteoprogenitor cells are germ cells, so or stem cells. So these are germ cells. They're typically large, large cells. Most germ cells are large cells. And these cells are constantly dividing and some of the daughter cells remain osteoprogenitor cells. Other daughter cells are going to, to mature a little bit and turn into osteoblasts. So osteoblasts are the progeny of osteoprogenitor cells. Notice that they're found on the surface of bones. So this is a bone right here, and osteoblasts are located on the surface of the bone. Uh, they are the ones that are gonna produce the osteoid, and uh, they allow for deposits of hydroxyapatite crystals on the matrix. Um, osteoblasts are constantly secreting matrix. And as they secrete matrix, so they're secreting the osteoid, and then they're allowing for the hydroxyapatite crystals to be also deposited. So pretty soon, they're going to be completely surrounded by bone matrix and they become trapped in the solid bone matrix. When that happens, they turn into osteocytes. So they mature into osteocytes once they are trapped inside the matrix. Um, as a matter of fact, you can remove an osteocyte from the matrix and goes back to being an osteoblast. Osteocytes are the mature cells of bone matrix. Their job is to maintain the matrix. So they're constantly removing old matrix and allowing new matrix to be deposited. So new calcium will be deposited. Uh, they're making new collagen fibers, removing all collagen fibers. Osteocytes are found inside the lacunae, which are the spaces within the bone matrix that are created so that these cells can live. Uh, notice that osteocytes are connected to each other via these little canals called canaliculi, uh, right here, so canaliculi, and the canals allows them to pass along nutrients and oxygen. So those little um, osteocytes that are closer to a blood vessel and are, have easy access to oxygen and nutrients can take on the oxygen and the nutrients and pass it along to the cells that are farther away from these sources of uh, nutrients and oxygen. Same thing, the waste will be transmitted to the, uh, uh, between each other and eventually put out into the blood vessels. So the, the canalicula are important to keep these, these cells that are found deep in bone tissue, keeping them alive. So that's uh, a, a, a important feature of the bone matrix at these little canals, okay? Um, the other cells that are not related to the osteocyte osteoblast family are the osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are very uh, different cells. Let me show you back here, the picture right here. This right here in an osteoclast. And there's a couple of things that is different about this cell. First of all, it's multinucleated. And second, it's very big. Also, it has this ruffled end right here on the end of the cell that's adjacent to the bone tissue. Any cell that has many nuclei is made from the fusion of many cells during development. So this is more than one cell that fused together and created this huge cell, which we call the osteoclast. Uh, the function of osteoclasts is to break up the matrix and reabsorb it. So the um, osteoclasts, are going to continually be uh, taking up matrix, so take up oste uh, the osteoid and the calcium, and then if this is a blood vessel right here, these cells are gonna take the, uh, these components of the matrix and release them into the blood. Okay, so they're going to break up these components and release them into the blood. So they're gonna get rid of the matrix, in other words. So where osteoblasts are building matrix, osteoblasts, osteoclasts are breaking it up. 
okay, the process is called osteolysis. Um, okay, so this is just a rougher border, multinucleated cells. The cells that we didn't, that were not depicted yet, were the osteoprogenitor cells. Uh, sometimes they're called osteochondral progenitor cells. Uh, these are adult stem cells that constantly differentiate into osteoblasts and, oste and uh, chondroblasts and osteoblasts. So in this picture right here, this is the osteoprogenitor cell. It is constantly dividing and giving rise to the osteocyte. Osteocytes are making matrix. And once they're completely surrounded by matrix, they turn into osteocytes. Um, that's another osteoblast, and this is the matrix being formed by here. Okay, so you need to be able to keep these cells straight and uh, keep their function uh, clear. Remember that the function of the osteocytes is to maintain the matrix, whereas osteoblasts secrete new matrix and osteoclast break down the matrix. OK, so um, bone is constantly being repaired. Uh, it's being made if it's broken. Uh, during development, we form, you know, uh, forms, uh, uh, bones are being formed. So bones that are in the process of being formed are called woven bone. And in woven bone, the collagen fibers are randomly and we see this woven bone during fetal development, and we see it during a bone. We also see it during a bone fracture. Uh, the remodeling of bone is the reshaping of bone, is the removing of all bone and adding new bone. Um, woven bone will be remodeled into a, a mature bone, which is called lamellar bone. So this remodeling goes on as a uh, new bone is being made. Is, uh, and also it it's goes on when we repair bone. So remodeling takes place as a result of repairing a bone or as a result of making new bone. So the mature bone is called lamellar bone. In lamellar bone, the matrix is highly organized. Collagen fibers are in the direction of uh, stress. And the plates of collagen fibers, the plate of matrix, I should say, the plates of matrix are called lamellae. And if you can see from this picture, in, um, in, a, uh, in a long bone, these plates of lamellae of matrix are formed in a circular manner, creating these elongated tubes. And there's going to be a concent concentric series of tubes that are going to be formed in the direction of the length of the bone. The collagen fibers in these in these structures are going to run in uh, perpendicular uh, directions. So if uh, these outside uh, uh, plate, the collagen fibers run in one direction. On the inside plate, they're going to run in a, the opposite direction, and the inner one will have them again in the opposite direction, and that's going to allow for twisting. Okay. So it's uh, the tissue is highly organized to withstand movement and stress. Bone tissue is organized into two different types of, of, uh, of tissue, what we call compact bone, which we found in bones that need to withstand weight in one direction, like long bones, like the femur, for example, or the humerus, versus the spongy bone, which is located in places where there's movement and therefore is stress in different directions. So there will be a spongy or cancellous bone versus compact bone. Uh, a spongy bone is uh, kind of easy because the, the name tells you what, it's what it looks like. It looks like a sponge. We're going to have in a spongy bone, let me go for this picture, it are these plates of uh, lamellae, of matrix, that are forming in the direction of stress. Okay. Uh, so this is called trabecula, these plates of lamellae. Uh, in the spaces, we're going to have marrow, bone marrow. And uh, you can see here the trabecula of the, at the end of long bones. So spongy bone is found in the places where the bones articulate, like at the end of a long bone. Uh, irregular bones have a center of a spongy bone. Notice, however, that every time you have a spongy bone, a spongy bone is sandwiched between layers of compact bone. 
So this is a layer of compact bone uh, on top and below the middle of the spongy bone. If you look at a long bone here, the spongy bone is the inside of the bone. But if you look on the outside, the bone is going to look smooth because that's going to be a, a thin layer of compact bone. Now, if you look at the shaft of the bone right here, you'll see how there is no spongy bone in this area. All we have is compact bone. So when it comes to spongy bone, know that trabecula are the plates of cartilage and um, that the spaces are where the marrow is going to be located. Now, compact bone is a lot more interesting because this is a specialized tissue that needs to withstand a lot of weight. So there's going to be a lot of different kinds of matrices found in, in compact bone. The basic construction, however, is going to be in uh, the form of these elongated tubes called osteons. Do not confu confuse osteon with osteoid, which was the organic component of the matrix. This is osteon, used to be called haversion systems. The osteons are these elongated tubes that are going to their microscopic tubes that are going to follow the shaft of the bone. These are the weight bearing structures. The way these tubes are constructed, right here you can see one osteon right here. Here's another osteon, here's another osteon, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. So you can see how this is a humerus and on the shaft of the humerus, this is what we're seeing here, um, we see uh, many of these osteons running in the direction of the length of the bone. Now, if you look at one osteon, like we see right here, notice that the plates of lamellae have been secreted around a canal in the middle. So these right here will be the central canal. So all this is important for, um, for lab also, because you should be able to uh, label these components in lab. Um, the, the lamella is going to be called a circumferential lamella, so because we have uh, these concentric circumferences of, um, of, of plates of lamella, one inside the other. This would be called circumferential lamella. Um, let's see here, let me go here. Um, within the lamella, we're going to have the osteo osteocytes inside the lacunae and the little uh, canaliculi connecting osteocytes. The central canal would be the place where blood vessels will run and nerves. So those are essentially the components of the osteon. Okay. Um, also notice that there are other forms of lamellae that we can see uh, in, the, in, the, in the tissue. Notice, for example, out here on the perimeter of the bone, we have these long uh, circular lamellae that follows the perimeter of the bone right before all of the osteoform. Uh, that lamellae is going to uh, be called circumferential lamellae. Okay, so this right here is called circumferential lamellae. because it's following the circumference of the bone. And let me just do something here. I think I, mis I mis mislabeled the lamellae in the osteon. The lamellae in the osteon is called concentric lamellae. I don't know what I called it before, but let me, if I didn't call it the concentric, then let me go ahead and correct it now. This is concentric lamellae because it's in concentric uh, tubes. Whereas the lamellae around the entire bone is gonna be called circumferential lamellae. So we have at least two types of lamellae. There's going to be a third one that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, so again, concentric lamellae is around the is in the osteon. This whole thing would be the osteon. Uh, circumferential lamellae is around the circumference of the bone. The third type of lamellae, I'm going to erase these, is going to be uh, in between osteons. So you have one osteon here. You have another osteon here, you have another osteon, another osteon. In between osteons, we can see the remnants of osteons right here, for example. Remember, bone tissue is not a static. It's constantly being remade, uh, refreshed. 
So old osteons are broken up and new ones are being made. So what remains of the old osteons um, are going to be called interstitial lamellae. Interstitial lamellae. So here, this part, this slide has all the three types of lamellae. Concentric lamellae is in the osteons, circumferential lamellae on the periphery of the bone, interstitial lamellae is what remains of the old osteons. So definitely know these structures, especially for lab. Um, then we're going to have the central canal, which brings in blood uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the bone. The, there are going to be other canals going across, like this one right here. And these canals are going to be called Borgman's canals or perforating canals. They have two names. So the old name was Borgman's canals. The new name is perforating canals. And perforating canals bring blood uh, to deeper parts of the body, of the bone. I'll also notice the, the uh, membrane that covers bone on the outside. The membrane is called the periosteum. And the little fibers that connect the periosteum to the bone are called perforating or sharpase fibers. All this is important, especially for lab. So we do have a model like this in lab, and you should be able to uh, name the components of the of compact bone from the model. Um, one thing to note: the cells, some of the cells of bone tissue, are going to be located right there, the periphery of bone tissue, between the periosteum and the surface of the bone. So osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, osteoclasts are all going to found, be found right there, sandwiched between periosteum and bone. Okay. Um, there are no questions. We can move on. This uh, next part is also good for lab, is important for lab. Uh, this is the classification of bones according to their shape. So according to shape, we can classify bone as long bones, which are the ones that we find in the limbs. Uh, the humerus, the femur would be a long bone. Uh, short bones would be uh, square little bones, which we find in places like the wrist, uh, the ankle, so for example, this, the uh, scaphoid, the lunate, uh, the um, uh, capitate, uh, trigotol, pisiform, uh, tra trapezoid, trapezium, all the carpal bones are considered short little cube bones. Uh, the, um, the ankle bones okay, are also considered short bones. Uh, the flat bones are flat and it's slightly curved. All of the bones of the cranium are considered flat bones. The sternum is a flat bone. Ribs are classified as flat bones. Irregular bones are, have complicated shapes, don't quite follow any of the other categories. So the vertebra would be flat, considered an irregular bone, for example. Uh, so these are just uh, the, the uh, different types of bones according to their shape and examples. So you should be able to recognize these kinds of examples and classify them as long, flat, uh, irregular, or short. Okay, the next portion is a little confusing to students. What this is, is this is the gross anatomy. Now notice that we saw what we saw earlier was the microscopic anatomy. When we were looking at lamellae, the osteon, the um, osteocytes, the central canal, we're looking at microscopic structures. What we're gonna look at is the gross anatomy of long bones. Okay, so these are parts of the long bone that you can see without the help of a microscope. So if you have a long bone, and a long bone could be a femur, it could be the humerus, it could be the phalanges of the uh, hand, the metacarpals, uh, metatarsals, all those are considered long bones. Uh, notice that the long bone has a shaft right here in the middle. Uh, the shaft is called the diaphysis of the bone. So we don't call it shaft, we call it diaphysis. And on either end of the diaphysis, there is a, a part of the bone that connects to other bones and it has a spongy bone tissue. We call these two parts the epiphysis of the bone. So notice here that the epiphysis has a spongy bone tissue while the diaphysis is made of 
uh, uh, compact bone tissue. The two uh, epiphyses, one is going to be proximal because it's going to be closer to the trunk and another one is going to be distal. Um, also notice that in the middle of the diaphysis, there is going to be the marrow of the, the bone marrow, the marrow cavity. Inside the marrow cavity, we're going to have the bone marrow. Um, notice that in the epiphysis is the place where we find the growth plate, right here and right here. And this bone is a young bone because the growth plate is depicted as white, as if it still has cartilage in there. That actually is called a, a plate uh, and not a line. So this is the epiphyseal plate or growth plate, which later will turn into the epiphyseal line once growth ends. So when we call it a line, it's, it has ended, the growth has ended. If we call it a plate, that means the growth plate, the, the, the bone is still growing. Okay, so you should be able to identify this, these structures from a picture of a long bone, be able to identify the diaphysis, the epiphysis, the proximal epiphysis, the distal epiphysis, the epiphyseal plate or line, depending on what's depicted. Uh, you should know that the epiphyseal parts of the long bone have spongy bone tissue, the diaphysis have compact bone tissue, the bone marrow is located in the marrow cavity of the diaphysis. There will also be bone marrow in the spaces in the between the trabeculae of epiphyseal plates. Okay, so the medullary cavity uh, could have either red marrow or yellow marrow, depending on the age of the bone. Red marrow is hematopoietic tissue. Yellow marrow is a fat tissue, which is a, 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 um, a storage of fat. Um, OK, when it comes to red marrow, uh, babies have red marrow in most of their bones. And as we age, red marrow is going to be replaced with uh, yellow marrow. By the time we're adults, red marrow will be only found in certain places like the uh, sternum, the, uh, the, the proximal end of the femur and the proximal end of the humerus, the uh, body of the vertebra, the pelvic bone. Okay. So you should know some of the bones that have red marrow in an adult. All right, this is again giving you the proximal epiphysis, the distal epiphysis. Notice that the epiphysis are covered with articular cartilage on either end, the little articular cartilage right there. Um, the marrow is inside of the diaphysis. We have a spongy bone in the epiphysis. Okay, and this is just showing you the periosteum. And remember, we mentioned that the cells of bone tissue are wedged between periosteum and bone. Uh, we talked about Sharpe's fibers are the fibers that connected the periosteum right here to the bone. Uh, we talked about the structure of flat bone as having as sand is being sandwiched between uh, two layers of compact bone. Okay. As you can see here, depicted in this bone of the cranium right there. So this is compact bone, compact bone, and sandwiched in between is the spongy bone. In an irregular bone, again, like the vertebra, uh, uh, again, you're going to see a spongy bone in the middle. If we were to break these bones, you're going to see a spongy bone inside. But on the outside, uh, we have compact bone. So you should have an idea of where the compact bone and the spongy bone are found. Okay, all right, so that is it for the first set of PowerPoints. Uh, let me go out. Oh, come on. Yeah. Give me just a second. Something's not going right. Oh, much better. Okay. So, um, if there are no questions, and we have time, we can move on to the second set of PowerPoints. Okay, 
So second set of power points. First thing we're going to do is look at the development of bone. Uh, how is bone made during uh, uh, embryonic and fetal life? And there are two mechanisms that are going to make bone. The process is called osteogenesis, process of ossification. Um, it begins early. It begins on the second month of development. It typically says to begin on the ninth week, eight to ninth week. Uh, so the um, the uh, change that occurs at that point is that the embryo changes into a fetus. So nine weeks is a fetus, eight weeks is an embryo. So that's essentially what where the um, where the uh, uh, demarcation lies. Um, now, bone growth will continue on until early adulthood. Um, bone remodeling and repair continues throughout our lifetime. So this is the reason why we need calcium throughout our lifetimes, because bone tissue is not dead tissue, it's live tissue, and it's constantly being uh, destroyed, the old ones and the old tissue, and new tissues being made. So during ossification, um, in the early in fetal life, late in embryonic life, so eighth, ninth week of development, uh, we have two forms of ossification that take place. One is called intramembranous ossification, another one is called endochondral ossification. The types of bone made by these processes are different. And so we're going to look at intramembranous ossification first. Um, intramembranous ossification makes bone from essentially mesenchymal tissue some fibrous membrane embryonic connective tissue. So this is essentially mesenchymal tissue. So mesenchymal tissue is, if you can imagine it, it would look like a dense irregular connective tissue. So imagine the dermis of the, of the skin. As a matter of fact, these bones are sometimes called dermal bones because they come from a tissue that looks very much like the dermis of the skin. So imagine the dermis of the skin and imagine the, uh, the long, uh, the, the thick uh, collagen fibers going all over the place and the little um, uh, fibroblasts all over the place. From that tissue, bone will be made. And I'll show you how in just a second. The other form of ossification is called endochondral. And in this case, you see the word chondro there, which tells you this is a cartilage. So in this case, the bones are going to be made from a cartilage model. So a cartilage, hyaline cartilage model of the bone will be replaced with, uh, with, a, uh, with bone tissue. Okay, so both methods will have woven bone at one point or another. Woven bone was the immature bone that matures later into you know, mature bone, into lamellar bone. Um, let's see. Okay, intramembranous ossification are going to form most of the bones of the skull. Uh, part of the mandible and the diathesis of the clavicles. So those are the bones that will be made by intramembranous ossification. Um, intramembranous ossification will begin with what are called centers of, of, of ossification, so areas in the tissue that begin to calcify. And from those areas, from those centers of ossification, bone begins to grow into different into all different directions. This type of ossification does not end by the time the baby is born. When the baby is born, this process is still going on. So when you feel a newborn's head, you're going to feel soft tissue in the areas that we call fontanelles. So those will be the areas where intramembranous ossification has not ended yet. Is still going on. Is still being bone is still being formed, and this separation of the bones that are that are just still not completed allows for the brain to grow. The uh, ossification will end between ages one and two years of age. Um, so this is a fetus. This will be a, a, a cranial bones. You can see here the centers of ossification and how uh, bone, uh, bone tissue is being formed from those centers of ossification. So essentially what's going to happen is that uh, within this, this mesenchymal tissue, uh, there will be an ossification center, a center in which these little fibroblasts will begin to congregate in one area. And calcium will begin to deposit in that area. The little fibroblasts are going to differentiate and will begin to uh, secrete matrix, meaning they're going to begin to secrete a lot more collagen fibers and will allow for more calcium to be deposited. 
Eventually, we're going to call these little cells uh, osteoblasts. And the process continues. And these little fibroblasts that now have turned into osteoblasts have secreted so much matrix and calcification has happened. And some of them are now trapped in the matrix. Now we're going to call them osteocytes once they're trapped in the matrix. The younger ones are still on the periphery of the center of ossification, creating more collagen fibers that allows for the trapping of more calcium. So the, the process continues to grow in that outward from the center of ossification. Um, in the process, remember this is, uh, this is connective tissue and connective tissue is vascular. So there's gonna be blood vessels running through and the blood vessels will become trapped by these, uh, these calcified tissue. Um, fibroblasts, you can see them here, will begin to align uh, in the direction on the surface of this, these uh, uh, bone tissue. And those fibroblasts, again, this is happening in the embryo, so these are all very, very, very young cells. These fibroblasts will eventually form the periosteum. So these fibroblasts aligning on the surface will form the periosteum so that as the process continues, you now have the little fibrous periosteum being formed. You have the little osteoblast secreting more and more matrix, uh, a spongy bone in the middle, a compact bone on either side, and pretty soon this, this becomes more and more mature. So this is a fetus, and you can see here one of these uh, bones, these bones being made, and this is the soft tissue in the middle uh, where intramembranous ossification is still taking place. So what you need to know from this process is the following. You need to know that the process ends uh, between one and two years of age, right here. Uh, you need to know what are fontanelles, the soft spots where this uh, intramembranous ossification in the skull is still taking place. You need to know that the star tissue is essentially mesenchymal tissue, sometimes described as soft uh, connective tissue. Okay, so um, you're not going to be asked to explain the process from beginning to end, but you should have an idea of uh, what kinds of bones are made. So that goes back to the other PowerPoint that told you the, the, the uh, gave you uh, the bones that were made by this process, the skull bones, parts of the mandible, uh, part of the clavicle, the, the shaft of the clavicle. Um, and again, when the process ends and that you know, fontanelles are uh, what uh, it is still uh, taking place after the baby is born, the, the uh, intramembranous ossification taking place. Okay, so that is one form of ossification. The other form of ossification is called endochondral ossification. And what we have in this case is a, a, a hyaline cartilage model of the bone that will be replaced with, cartilage, with bone tissue. The process ends, takes a lot longer to end, it takes 18 to 20 years to end. So this is the process that allows for the growth of long bones. So it starts out early in development, eight to nine weeks of development. The little long bone has been uh, made with uh, hyaline cartilage. So this is hyaline cartilage. And a couple of things are gonna happen. Notice that in the middle, calcium is gonna be formed. For one thing, so there's there is a, a center of ossification that begins to form in the middle of the cartilage. More importantly, there is ossification that begins to take place on either side of the cartilage here and here. And that is a problem. It's called the bone color because uh, hyaline cartilage is not vascular. So it is dependent on diffusion of oxygens and nutrients to keep the cells alive. If all of a sudden calcification happens, uh, on the sides of the cartilage. Now, those cells in the middle are not gonna have access to oxygen and, uh, and uh, nutrients. They're gonna begin to die. So cartilage cells begin to die and they leave uh, holes behind. Uh, then the next thing that happens is that blood vessels begin to invade the area, the cartilage. This is happening in the fetus, uh, three months right there. What that means is that the cells traveling inside the 
thought are going to be germ cells, very, very young cells. What these blood vessels are bringing are essentially osteoprogenitor cells, hematopoietic cells that are now going to invade this calcified tissue. The um, uh, osteoclasts, which are essentially macrophages, are going to come in and begin to eat up this calcified matrix, creating a, a cavity inside. Um, osteo begins to set home and, and begin to uh, 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 calcify the area even more. Um, later on at birth, what we have at birth is the other two centers of ossification already begun. Uh, so that will be at the diaphysis. And notice that blood vessels invade those areas as well. So that as the uh, child continues to grow, what we're going to end up with is a center of ossification in the epiphysis, in the proximal epiphysis. We have the diaphysis, the shaft, calcified, or is still you know, in the process of being calcified, and then another center of ossification in the, uh, in the distal dia uh, epiphysis. Notice that in between, okay, let me go back here. Um, this one right here. Okay. So these are the two centers of the three centrification, one on each epiphysis, one in, one in the middle. Uh, the cartilage, what remains of the cartilage? We have a plate of cartilage right here between epiphysis and diaphysis. Another plate right here. Those will be your epiphyseal plates or growth plates. And then there's the, the uh, hyaline cartilage at the end of the bone, will remain hopefully throughout our entire lives, and that is the articular cartilage. So that is essentially uh, what happens during endochondral ossification. Um, again, this is at birth. We have all centers of ossification, but the process is not even close to being finished. There's just still a lot of ossification taking place. It will continue on for the next uh, 15, 18, 20 years. Um, eventually, the uh, epiphyseal plate will close, will calcify, and the uh, bone will finish growing. So while the bone is growing, it's going to be growing in length in those areas so that the um, uh, cartilage will be growing in this direction towards like that. Bone will be growing following the cartilage. And so this plate will, the growth of the cartilage will, will push the plate outward. So now we're going to be here, right there, as this continues to grow. Uh, that is a, a little fetus, and you can see the growth plates right there because it's soft tissue. It doesn't show in the, um, in, the in the X rays. So interstitial growth and endochondral ossification occur during development, and that's the way how bones are made. Um, endochondral ossification allows for the growth in length of long bones. Now we did say bone is active tissue. And it continues to grow, if not in length, at least in thickness or entire life, or at least it could grow in thickness or entire life. The growing in thickness and remodeling of the bone, if it is damaged, um, is a positional growth. So a positional growth is the growth that continues throughout our lifetime, and it is going to replace all bone, sometimes replaces cartilage, unfortunately, um, and turns it into, into bone tissue. And this is what happens during a positional growth. Remember that the osteoblasts are located on the surface of the bone. And they continue, so this is the little surface of the bone. The osteoblasts are located on the surface. And they're going to continue to secrete a uh, matrix. So as they secrete matrix, the bone thickens, which as you can see here. This is the, the active part of the bone tissue right here. This down here is not as active. so it's continue to secrete matrix, and so the bone grows in thickness, it's trapping little blood vessels in the process, and now all of a sudden you have a bone that has thickened right here. Okay, so similar here, the bone will be grow in thickness. Uh, now, um, inside the marrow cavity, osteoclasts are going to eat up so that the, the marrow cavity doesn't close down, because we also have osteoblasts in the, in the marrow cavity. So osteoclasts are also found on the surface, eating up the bone uh, to, so that it shapes it according to the shape that it's supposed to have. So again, a positional growth is, allows for the bone to continue to grow in thickness throughout our lives. 
Um, interstitial growth is what happens after birth uh, at the epiphyseal plate as the cartilage becomes uh, calcified and the bone growth grows in length. So this is the continuation of endochondral ossification, the interstitial growth. Eventually, the epiphyseal plate will be changed into an epiphyseal line, and that takes about 20, 12 years, sometimes you know, 12, 25, something like that. It depends on sex, depends on genetics, when it's going to end. Articular cartilage doesn't ossify, it remains a, as articular cartilage. Now, we're going to quickly look at what happens at the growth plate as growth is, is going on. So this is what happens um, at, the, at the growth plate. This is interstitial growth. And let me show you the picture here. This is a picture of a growth plate. And with, I'm going to start actually down here. So down here is the bone tissue. So this right here is this part right there. OK, so this is bone. So this is the ossification zone. And above the ossification zone is an area where calcification is taking place. This right here is cartilage, and uh, these are older cartilage cells. That's why they look bigger, because they're older, and they're close to the zone of calcification, and that's partly why they're dying, is because they are losing access to, um, to uh, uh, oxygen and nutrients, and they're being calcified. So this is an area that is going to be also eventually calcified. So this is a zone of hypertrophic zone of cartilage where the cartilage is beginning to die. This is the healthy cartilage, uh, which is uh, dividing and growing in this direction right there. So as the bone is growing, bone is growing behind the cartilage. Cartilage is growing ahead of the bone. And as that happens, the bone grows in length. So if you go back here to this picture, Bone is growing in this direction, cartilage is growing in that direction, pushing the epiphyseal plate with it out. And the grow bone continues to grow in length. Um, okay, so osteogenesis is intramembranous ossification and chondral ossification, which happens before birth or continues after birth, after one or two years in the case of intramembranous ossification. Uh, uh, it stops at early adulthood in the case of endochondral ossification. Uh, bone growth after birth, we call it interstitial growth, which is the growth of the length at the growth plate, or ap anapositional growth, which is the thickness of growth that continues of the of the bone that continues throughout life. Um, before we go into factors that affect bone growth, let me explain something else, which actually has to do with factors that affect bone growth. OK, so here we have the long bone that is growing. Uh, we have the cartilage in the growth plate right here is growing. And then we have the diathesis here. OK, so we have this is the diathesis of the bone. I'm sorry, this is the epiphysis of the bone. So this is the epiphysis. This is diathesis, and this is the cartilage right there. So cartilage is growing in this direction. Bone is growing in this direction. Okay. All right, um, and the bone continues to grow in length. Uh, then puberty comes along, and with puberty comes the secretion of sex hormones. Now we have testosterone being secreted in large quantities. And uh, this does, to, this does, I cannot write and talk at the same time. Give me just a second. Okay, oh dear. All right. Um, okay, let's move on. I'll come back and do the other one in just a second. So well, now we have testosterone and estrogen. Okay, and there's a point here that I want to make. So give me a second here. Okay, it's growing in this direction. This is growing in this direction. Uh, both of these hormones are going to stimulate osteoblast activity. And all of a sudden, the little osteoblasts are going to be stimulated more than the cartilage. So all of a sudden, the cartilage, the, the bone tissue begins to calcify very, very quickly because of the actions of testosterone and estrogen. Cartilage cannot, cannot um, keep up, and the plate calcifies and turns into bone tissue. So the 
reason why the plate is going to close is because of the actions of testosterone and estrogen. Uh, they are going to stimulate osteoblast activity so much that they're going to calcify the plate very quickly. Cartilage cannot keep up with the growth of the bone and the whole area turns into bone. Okay. Now, the next question is, um, which of the two hormones, uh, whether it is uh, testosterone or estrogen, has a stronger stimulation of osteoblasts? Um, turns out osteoblasts uh, get a stronger stimulation from estrogen. Testosterone does not stimulate as, as much, and that's why females finish their growth quicker than males do. It's because estrogen is a stronger stimulant of osteoblast activity than, uh, than testosterone is. So if we go now into what is needed for good bone growth, the obvious things will be calcium, uh, protein for the collagen, uh, obviously phosphate. Uh, we're gonna need vitamin D, because vitamin D is needed in order to absorb calcium from the intestines. So we don't have vitamin D, we're not gonna have enough calcium. Bones are gonna be soft. Uh, the condition is called rickets in children, osteomalacia in adults. And we're gonna need vitamin C because vitamin C is gonna be needed for the production of collagen. So if we don't have vitamin C, bones will have no collagen, they will be brittle. Uh, we need hormones, the actions of growth hormones, because they're going to stimulate, especially during uh, uh, childhood and later on during puberty, they're going to stimulate the, the growth of cartilage and uh, the growth of bone. Thyroid hormone is needed for, uh, the, uh, uh, um, for growth hormone to work properly. We need sex hormones. Uh, estrogen and testosterone stimulate osteoblast activity causing the growth of puberty. Uh, so because these sex hormones stimulate osteoblasts so strongly, bone overtakes cartilage and the growth ends. Estrogen triggers quicker response from osteoblasts than testosterone, and that's the reason why uh, women will grow quicker, finish their growth quicker than males will. Um, growth hormone can affect growth. Uh, so abnormal secretion of growth hormone will give us gigantism or dwarfism. So before puberty, if there's too much growth hormone, the condition is called gigantism. If there's not enough growth hormone, then bones will not grow properly and you will have dwarfism. So definitely know that what is needed for bone growth. Um, especially important are going to be um, the vitamin C for collagen, vitamin D for calcium, and the hormones. Um, bone remodeling refers to the changes in bone as we use the bone. Uh, we may use remodeling for repair. Um, we may use the bone to adjust how we use it, for example. One thing about osteoblasts, osteoblasts are susceptible to stress, mechanical stress. So mechanical stress stimulates osteoblast activity. So the more we use a bone, the more we're stimulating osteoblasts, the thicker that bone becomes. So when it costs, stress refers to mechanical stress. So think of a tennis player. The arm that is that the, the player uses to play with becomes thicker than the other arm. Pitchers have a pitch arm, which you know they have a thicker arm on the one that they, they, they in the limb that they pitch. So that's because osteoblast respond to mechanical stress, to the use of the bone by becoming more active. Uh, that's why they also tell you to do bone bearing exercise, weight bearing exercises, because weight stimulates osteoblast activity. Um, so um, healthy bone depends on a healthy balance between the activity of osteoblasts, which respond to mechanical stress by increasing their activity, and osteoclasts, which are removing bone tissue. So in order to have osteo, uh, uh, healthy bones, the activity of osteoblasts should be balanced by the activity of osteoclasts. 
the minute the bone will get set, we're not going to have healthy bones. So if you think about it, for example, in women uh, during menopause, uh, before menopause, throughout no, the prior uh, state, estrogen was available to stimulate osteoblast activity. And that kept bone thick and healthy. The minute uh, menopause set in, the levels of estrogen severely decrease, and now we have a diminishing osteoblast activity. Osteoclast activity now overtakes osteoblast activity, and we begin to see problems like osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. Okay, so that's one reason why 80% of osteoporosis patients are women is because women have to go through uh, menopause. Throw into the whole mixture the fact that women are generally smaller, uh, is smaller muscle mass. So throughout life, their bones are not experiencing the same level of mechanical stress that they will develop in a male, for example, with thicker muscles. Uh, that gives you, again, less mechanical stress to stimulate osteoblasts. Throw into the mixture, if the woman has had children, during pregnancy, there has been a diminishing of the calcium in the bones to be given to the fetus. So that's another problem that women have. Again, that's why osteoporosis is so much more predominant in women than it is in males. You should know that. You should know the reasons why osteoporosis is so prevalent in females. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is just showing you bone being remodeled. And um, yeah, this is uh, interstitial growth, uh, bone growth that ends with the epiphyseal line, uh, the closure of the epiphyseal line. Um, this is showing you how bone remodels itself and the areas where there's more stress, bone will become thicker. The areas where there's less stress, osteoclast will eat it up and that's how bone acquires its, its natural shape. The other point about these two is if we begin to misuse the bone uh, due to pain, for example, um, bone will become to thicken in areas where it shouldn't thicken and be thinner in areas where it shouldn't be thinned. So depending on the mechanical stress we're putting in the bone, the bone could be misshapen. Okay, so again, stress, and that, that means mechanical stress, causes the bone remodeling, increases bone mass, and aligns the cula with the stress lines, which could be good or could be bad, depending on what the lines are. Okay, so now, um, we're going to quickly go over bone repair. We're going a little bit over time, so I'm going to move a little bit quicker now. Um, bone repair through a fracture. The main point here is the bone is hematopoietic tissue. I'm sorry, bone is a vascular tissue. So when we break bone, there will be a hematoma form. There will be bleeding. Um, the first stages of the repair will be to make a hyaline cartilage seal for the bone. Uh, get rid of the little pieces, so macrophages will get rid of the little pieces. This little color right there will be made with hyaline cartilage. And then the hyaline cartilage will be ossified. And notice that the misshapen of the bone right here, um, as soon as this happens, we want to begin to use the bone so that the callus right here that has been formed can be uh, remodeled. As we use the bone, we're going to put a stress in the correct areas and osteoclasts will begin to eat up the areas that need to be cleaned out and we will end up with, a, with a, you know, sh the correct shape of the bone. Okay. So you should have an idea of what happens uh, to bone as it is repair after a break. Um, the other point here would be uh, the regulation of, of uh, calcium in the blood. Uh, because bone is the storage of calcium, that is the place where hormones are going to go to to get the calcium to put it in the blood. There are two hormones that are involved in uh, blood calcium metabolism. That's going to be PTH, parathyroid hormone, which is secreted by the parathyroid gland. And PTH is going to increase blood calcium levels which means that it's going to stimulate osteoclast activity, diminish osteoblast activity in order to, for the osteoclast to rob 
calcium from the bones and put it into the blood. So PTH it stimulates osteoclast activity, also stimulates vitamin D uh, because we need more calcium from food to be put into the blood, and also is going to increase the reabsorption of calcium from urine. Instead of urinating the calcium, now we're going to trap it and put it back into the blood. All three activities will accomplish the same purpose to increase blood calcium. So definitely no PTH increases blood calcium. So this is a little diagram that tells you how PTH works. It stimulates osteoclasts, so now we are um, removing calcium from uh, bone and putting it into the uh, into blood. Uh, we are uh, it uh, stimulates vitamin D so that now there's more vitamin D to get calcium from the uh, food. And then it is finally going to prevent the kidneys from urinating the calcium and instead it's going to trap it and put it back into the blood. The antagonistic hormone to PTH is calcitonin, which is secreted by the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is going to stimulate osteoblast activity, which means we're going to put calcium into the bone, so it's going to decrease uh, blood calcium. So it's going to do exactly the opposite from PTH. So calcitonin decreases blood calcium. PTH is going to increase blood calcium, which means if blood calcium levels are high, the body will begin to secrete calcitonin in order to bring the blood calcium levels down. On the other hand, which is typically the problem, if blood calcium levels are low, the body will secrete PTH, and PTH will begin to increase blood calcium levels. Okay, so you should definitely know the actions of PTH and calcitonin in regards to blood calcium levels. Now, think about these two. Um, we can use these hormones to treat conditions like osteoporosis. If uh, calcitonin is going to uh, lower blood calcium and put cal blood calcium in, uh, into the bone, that may be a thing to give to a, a patient with osteoporosis, for example. Okay. Um, finally, we're going to quickly take a look at what happens to bone as we age. And essentially what happens is that the matrix will thin out. Uh, we're going to have problems. Um, so there will be less calcium. We're going to have problems uh, absorbing calcium from food. Uh, bone mass begins to decrease by age 30. And unless we do something about it to reverse it, it will just decrease. So that's why you need to do weight bearing exercise. Now be mindful of the calcium that we eat, vitamin D, etc. Um, it says rate bone loss increases tenfold after menopause in women. So that's a dramatic bone loss that, that happens. So you need to accumulate your bone, your, yeah, your calcium in your bones while you still have estrogen. Um, osteoporosis is the loss of bone mass, bone resorption. Throw into the picture the fact that we'll have less vitamin D as we age, and we have a big problem here. Uh, osteoporosis typically happens in the bones, of, first happens in the bones of the spine, uh, the neck of the femur, all these bones that are subject to a lot of stress. Uh, risk factors, lack of estrogen, lack of calcium, lack of vitamin D. Uh, small people, the small women are more susceptible. Uh, lack of mobility, which uh, diminishes the mechanical stress that osteoblasts need to be working. Low levels of thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, diabetes. And this picture gives you a dramatic view of osteoporotic bone compared to healthy bone. Uh, treatment, okay, well, uh, yeah, calcium, vitamin D, other, you know, other minerals. Uh, this is important, increasing weight-bearing exercise throughout life. Sometimes uh, hormonal replacement therapy may be indicated. Um, drugs that are used, Fosamax, um, uh, non uh, uh inhibitors of, est a of uh, estrogen, statins, um, what these drugs are going to do is they're going to stimulate um, osteoblast activity, or more importantly, they're going to 
in his <coughs> class activity. So they're going to inhibit osteoclasts and allow osteoblast to be more active. Okay. Um, last step, the bone fractures, and uh, you should know the basics. Uh, compound fracture is one in which the bone breaks the skin. A simple fracture is one that remains closed. Um, yeah, an incomplete fracture extends through the entire bone. I'm sorry, through just part of the bone. A complete fracture extends across the bone. So this right here is an example of an incomplete fracture. This is called a green stick fracture. It happens in young children which have soft bones. And you can see how the bone has bended like a green stick. So pressure has been put on the bone. And that's caused the bone to begin partial break right here. Um, typical of a bone that can bend enough to just break in one side. Uh, this is another partial fracture, a little hairline fracture, uh, common in, in bones like the skull bones, for example. A comminuted fracture, on the other hand, is common in elderly patients where the bones are brittle, and so the bone breaks into tiny pieces. Okay, so I think that is it for the chapter. Uh, any questions? Okay, so the session has been recorded, so I'll go ahead and make the recording available later.